Uh, well, good morning, New Hope. It's good to see you. Uh, there's a lot of people that are joining online. We're glad that you are here as well online. Um, this is a great day to start off your week, right? This isn't the end of the week, in my opinion. This is the start of the week, and you may have rolled in here from last week, just barely scraped and crawled and got here, but you're here, all right? And I, I can't think of a better place to start off your week than being in church with your church family, amen? This is a great place, so I'm, I'm super glad that you're here. Show of hands, if you have gotten some type of summer vacation or like a getaway this weekend so, or this year so far. Show of hands, all right? That's good. Show of hands if you are gonna squeeze something in in the next few weeks before school kicks off or whatever, all right? Good luck, have fun with that. My family, we went to Colorado, out to the Rocky Mountains. We went into the Rocky Mountains and it was so much fun. There's a big difference though, if you've been out there from the 900 feet of elevation that we're at to the 9,000 feet of elevation that we stayed at. Uh, we were sucking wind for those first few days and uh, I told uh, someone earlier that when you go to those little gift shops and they have tanks of oxygen, it looks like a joke, but it's the real deal. Like, uh, if you're going out there, it might be worth buying a few of those. But we went out there and if you saw either what we packed when we took or what we brought back after the trip, it would tell you a story of what we did, right? The places that we went, the souvenirs, the t-shirts, the sweatshirts, or what we took along with us. Some of you, when you go to the beach, if we notice what's in your bag or when you come back, we can, it tells us a story. So you're taking your flip-flops, your, your swimming suit, your towel, uh, the bucket hats, probably the SPF 100, whatever it may be, where you're going. If you're going to the mountains, you know, you're taking your trail mix, a compass, probably some type of hiking shoes, maybe some oxygen, something like that, right? And it tells you a story of either where you're going or when you're done and you unpack, it tells you what you've done. And I wanna challenge each and every one of us here, no matter what age you are, to be a student of the Bible. Every one of us, we need to be a student of the Bible. We need to unpack what the Bible is saying because when you do this, I promise you, you will gain understanding of what you're reading. It, you will gain context. Context is key, isn't it? You've heard that saying before, context is key. It's the who, what, where, when, and why of what you're reading, no matter what book it is, but in, in this setting, obviously God's word in the Bible. And so when you do that, it adds depth, it adds color to the story more than just a surface reading. And let me give you a quick example. In my Sunday school class uh, that I teach, and normally I teach at 9.30, so I'm, I'm not usually a part of this uh, service, so it's good to see a lot of smiling faces that I don't normally get to see. But this summer, we've been going through the Lord's Prayer. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he says this. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, finish it with me, hallowed be your name, right? Or holy is your name. And if you look at that word name, part of what that is getting at is this. Name equals character, who he is, all right? So let's think about it again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your character, who you are. And so when you begin to pray and you begin to understand more of that, it adds so much more depth when you do pray and when you do study of who God is and his character and what he's all about. You get it? So we're gonna unpack a little bit of Second Peter today and turn with me in your Bibles. We'll get there in just a moment. We finished up 1 Peter last week. Go back and watch any of them if you miss them or if you need to uh, be challenged again on the book of 1 Peter, but we're gonna kick off 2 Peter today. It's three chapters. Uh, one resource I wanna uh, encourage you to use, and not just this week, but in your studies, is this website called bibleproject.com, bibleproject.com. And you can go there and they have videos, and what they started out doing was giving overviews of all the books of the Bible, all right? And it's a, it's a different way to be able to present it, but I promise you, it, it brings some good context and it helps unpack what the, what the book is gonna be about. So go, back, go this week and, and watch it, or if you get bored, you can watch it during service. I don't care, you know, just to keep the volume down. Um, but watch it, and it'll 
provide some good context of what Second Peter is. So today we're going to unpack this book a little bit, and then we're going to um, open up into chapter one. So Peter is writing this this book to the same group of churches that that happened to First Peter, um, the, the Christians who are have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This was written shortly before he died. Uh, so this is kind of like a farewell letter. How many of you know that when someone is close to passing away, sometimes those words that they're sharing are nearest and dearest to their heart? And this is kind of what that is. Uh, he wrote it most likely in Rome, the same location as First Peter. And here's why he wrote it. This is important. Peter is writing to believers, um, warning them of their supposed leaders who had a corrupt lifestyle. Uh, they had distorted theology. They were coming against the teachings of Jesus. And that's why Peter, as a, a spiritual father in a sense to some of these Christians, wants to help them. He, these, these people, they thought that God didn't care about their moral decisions. That, that it was okay to do whatever they wanted because they had a bunch of knowledge and therefore that superseded whatever they did throughout the day. And Peter's like, no, 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 that's not what we do. They would use God's grace and freedom as a license to do whatever they wanted. So they were also accusing Peter and, and Christians of that day that the resurrection of Jesus never happened. All right, that's, that's a, a bold statement, and Peter wants to address that. They were also, in chapter 3, that we'll get to in a couple weeks, they scoffed at the idea that Jesus was coming back. All right, they made fun of it. That happens still today, guys. That still is happening today. People are scoffing at the idea, when is it going to happen? And so Peter, he's not going to be around much longer, and he wants to have something to pass on to future generations, to that next group of people, that next group of Christians. He wants to address these accusations, these, these uh, corrupt lifestyles of their supposed leaders. He wants to equip the church. And listen, I firmly believe that everything that is written in God's word is still relevant for us today. It's still relevant. I'm so appreciative of people like Peter or other writers of the books of the Bible, Paul, who addressed these issues then. Because if they didn't, where would things be now? We needed someone then to address these issues. And listen, we need to apply the word of God to our life, which goes back to us being a student of the Bible. Amen? We need to do that ourselves. So we're going to focus on the first half of chapter 1. And if you're there, we're going to get started. If not, scramble and get there quickly. Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Real quickly, I want you to notice something. In verse one, Peter calls himself a servant. And in the Greek, that also is used as bond servant. So back then, let me give you some context. Back then, uh, a slave after six years was free. All right, free from service, they could go be a free person. But if they wanted to remain in the, the service of their, their master, they could. Um, they would simply have some type of identification that they chose to do it. And a lot of times it was an earring that would be placed in their ear. And so that was saying, I'm choosing to serve this person. I'm choosing to remain as a servant of this person or a slave of this person. And so think of this. Peter says, I'm a, I'm a bond servant of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I witness so much that I'm choosing to serve Jesus. I'm choosing to be an apostle, to, to spread the good news. And man, after everything that he witnessed, why wouldn't he, right? Why wouldn't he choose to do that? So Peter calls himself a servant. The second thing is this, is that he recognizes that their faith in verse two, um, or the end of verse one, that their faith is the same as his, all right, it's all the same playing field. He's not greater than them and they're lesser than, than him, anything like that. There's no indication of that. In fact, he uses this word precious. And if you're taking notes, write precious equals beyond calculation. Okay, that's essentially what that word means, beyond calculation. And it, it's true, isn't it? The blood of Jesus is precious. 
The promises of God's word are precious. They are beyond calculation. And so Peter, he is not sitting, okay, I'm just like trying to paint a picture real quick so you get the essence of where his heart is. Peter, he's not sitting at the head of the table with all of the power couples of his day, dining with all the nice food, while everybody else is in line with their lunch tray waiting for, you know, the the sloppy joe to be put on their plate. That's not it at all. Peter, he says, listen, your faith is my faith. We have the, the same kind of faith, and it's precious, and it's common to all of us. So pick up in verse three. Peter continues to say, his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, this is where we're gonna hang out for a while today. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness To goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. Listen what he says. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind, and he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Would you pray with me? God, in these next few moments, as we dig into your word, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, you see where every person is at in their faith. Would you encourage and challenge and equip? In your mighty name we pray, and everybody said, amen. The title of today is this, Never Stop Growing. Never Stop Growing. Here's why. This is a lifelong response to Jesus Christ. What our faith is a lifelong response to Jesus Christ. We must never stop growing. So the first point to go along with it is this. You have everything that you need. All right, in verse three, Peter says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. You can do this, guys, because you have everything that you need. Right now, you have everything you need. The Christian life, it begins with faith in Jesus, period. That's where you begin. That's the starting point, placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And in just a few moments, we're gonna pray. And if anyone would like to do that, we're gonna pray with you to put your faith in Jesus. When you know Jesus, all right, and you'll see Peter, he uses that word know or knowledge. It's beyond just information, everybody. It's beyond just gathering a bunch of facts and stats and stories of the Bible and storing it up here. It's a practical side of it too. That's what that word also means. There's a practical side of this knowledge. So when you know Jesus, you know the power of God. I promise you, when you know him, that power is there. And guess what? That power produces life and godliness. That's what that power produces. So when you're born into the family of God, when you place your faith in Jesus, you are equipped with everything that you need to live out that faith with God. Everything that you need, God has given it all to you. Nothing needs to be added. Peter, he's addressing some of these accusations and these false teachings back then that they were saying you have to add these things to the work of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And he's like, nope. Nothing needs to be added. I witnessed it, I saw it, and the power of God is so real, you don't have to add extra stuff to it. Live out your faith according to God's word. Think of this, when a healthy baby is born, it has everything it needs to live. It just needs to grow, right? Uh, I have three amazing kids that I'm extremely grateful for and I'm proud of. And when they were born, everything that they needed was packed into their tiny little bodies. Parents, you remember that moment. Even though at that moment, well, you don't remember the moment with my kids, okay? But you remember the moment with your kids. But even though at that moment, they weren't going to be, they weren't what they would be at some point. They had everything they needed, they just needed to grow. My kids didn't have, don't have this job growing up of finding an extra arm, all right? So that at some point they can excel in the job that they're supposed to do or the, support, the sport that they're supposed to do. They don't have that. They just, they need to grow. I want you to notice what Peter is saying. He doesn't say it will be given to you someday. It already has been given to you. When you placed your faith in, in him, in Jesus Christ, 
It's already there. When, when we put our faith in Jesus, we, be, we become a Christian of this precious family. We have everything that we need, but here's the problem. People don't understand that, or they, they don't take God's word for what it is. And so they search for additions onto the work of Jesus Christ. They're searching for that next great book or that podcast to really reveal the faith in their life. Now, don't get me wrong, books and podcasts, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's what we're searching for beyond our faith in Jesus, then that's wrong. We're looking for that next inspirational person to really dig out the deep, dark secrets of our faith when really we already have what we need. We just need to grow in our faith, amen? We need to grow. So here's my challenge. Stop searching for whatever it is to reveal that faith within you. You have it when you placed your faith in him. You just need to grow. And because we have everything that we need to grow, we need to be committed to growing. That's your second point. You need to be committed to growing. Notice what Peter says in verse five. Make every effort. The NASB says applying all diligence. In other words, this needs to be priority. This needs to be an important part of our life to make every effort to add to our faith what we're about to go through. John Corson, in his Bible commentary, he says it like this. In light of the fact that we have everything that we need to enjoy life fully and to live godly, in light of the fact that we've been given hundreds of promises so graciously, in light of the fact that we are free of the grasp of lust, we are to be those who add to their faith diligently. And so as we go through this list, I want you to take inventory of your faith and of your life and say, am I giving everything that I can to grow in these? Am I applying every effort, making all effort that I can to, to grow? Because I want you to know something. This might be a newsflash for some of us. Growth is not automatic. It's just not. God doesn't make you more like Jesus against your will. Be, or, or just because he wants you, wants you to, but you don't. Without your involvement, there needs to be cooperation. This growth is a part of our Christian faith. There has to be discipline. There has to be a determination, that desire within you to grow in your faith. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to cultivate this. We have to grow. Paul even says in Philippians chapter two, to continue to work out your salvation. That doesn't mean work for your salvation. Jesus has already done that. But he says, work out your salvation. Let me, let me tell you, the verb of that means this, is, is like working in a mine. So you're, you're getting out of the mine all of the valuable ore that was possible. All right, the purpose of us, when we place our faith in Jesus, the purpose is this, is to be Christ-like. That's the purpose. We're, we don't just commit to the promises of Jesus, all right? We don't just commit to the good stuff. We commit to the commands also. There's, there's a, a way to live to honor God and to, to live Christ-like. This spiritual growth is not God's work alone. It's not like we come here on Sundays and we pray a prayer and then Monday through Saturday, it's God's responsibility to do everything else. Well, God, I prayed yesterday, so you need to work today and work tomorrow and, and I'll see you again on Sunday. No, there's a responsibility that you and I have. The Bible even talks about um, staying connected to the vine, right? Ab abiding in Christ. There's a responsibility that we have. We need to make every effort to be like Jesus. So Peter, he makes this list, and we're gonna go through it quickly. He makes this list, and back then, lists were common uh, because you couldn't get your hands on a book as easily as we can today. And if you did, it maybe wasn't as cost-effective as what it is for us to be able to, to purchase one, all right? And so, Peter recognizes this and, and they would use lists in a lot of different writings because they wanted something that would be easily memorized, something that you could kind of just uh, go through one to the next to the next to the next, kind of like the fruit of the spirit, right? And some of you, if, if you think right now in your head, you could start reciting the fruit of the spirit. Those were common, that was part of the purpose. So I do wanna say before we go through this list, this list isn't meant to be worked on one at a time, all right? It's not like, uh, once, once you conquer self-control, 
then you can move on to perseverance because some of us will be stuck on self-control for the rest of our life, all right? <laughs> We're developing each quality as we exercise them as well at the same time. Does that make sense? So we're working on all of them together. So I want us to quickly look over this list. And as we, we do, look at your own faith. And I firmly believe, church, I firmly believe now more than ever before, we need to grow in these. In our society and what's happening in our world and in our culture, we need to be Christ-like followers. Not just Sunday morning attenders, but Christ-like followers. All right, my style is more teaching than preaching, so you're stuck with me today. If you don't like it, there'll be somebody different next week, all right? But we're gonna talk through this. So, so Peter, he says, make every effort to add to your faith. He's assuming there's already faith to the readers of that day. He says, add to your faith goodness. Uh, some translations use this word moral excellence or virtue or courage is what it's saying. So you and I, we have the strength to stand up for what is right. When you place your faith in Jesus, you have within you the strength to stand up for what is right. We are supposed to bring attention to God, being Christ-like, we're supposed to do that because we have his nature. Sometimes that calls for us to stand up for what is right and not what's popular, not what everybody else is doing, but you stand up for what you know is the right thing because God's word says so. And that is what goodness is referring to, to have the moral excellence, the virtue, the courage, the backbone, the goodness. He goes on to say, add to your goodness knowledge. And like I said from the beginning, we need to be students of the Bible. We need to be digging in, getting our nose in here and studying and reading. But it also has a practical side of it, a practical discernment to, to live out what, what we're reading. It's more, listen, if this is more than being spiritually minded. You have to be earthly good, right? You have to live out what you read. Don't just acquire it up here, but work it out, live it out. You're not going to be perfect, all right? So don't look at the person next to you or across this room today and, and be judgy on them because they need to work on self-control or they need to work on their goodness or anything like that. No, you reflect inwardly, all right? And you work this out, you cultivate it. He moves on to self-control. This is what it is, guys. This is, you gotta get a grip of yourself. That's what it means. Raise your hand if you've ever said that to yourself. Get a grip of yourself, right? In, the, in a moment like that, how many of you have ever said that to somebody else? Get a grip of yourself. Get some self-control. This is where your passions are your servants and not your master, all right? You can control things. And I, I believe that this is one that is difficult for so many people. But just because we have the information of what God's word says doesn't mean we can get, just go do whatever we want. We need to have self-control. Here's the deal. You're gonna destroy yourself if you don't have self-control. You will wreck your testimony of Jesus Christ without self-control. This is what Peter is wanting the Christians back then to do because their supposed leaders and, and people in faith were living however they wanted to do because they had a bunch of information in their head. And Peter's like, nope, you need to have self-control. You need to stand out. You need to live differently so that you can have a powerful testimony. There's something different. For some of you, your anger is getting the best of you and it's wrecking your testimony. For other people, maybe it's lust and sexual addictions. They're unbridled in your life. There's no self-control. Maybe for some, it's the money and the position at the job that is like your main focus and you're doing whatever you can to gain as much money as possible or to climb that ladder of success and you're out of control. Your spending is out of control so when it comes time to given the offering to pay your tithe, you, you can't and you don't and you won't because it's a heart issue now because it's out of control. Listen, in temptation, the Bible says there is a way, way out so we don't have excuse. And I wanna challenge you on this before we move on. Do not let the name of Jesus 
become less important in somebody's life because you don't have self-control. Let's move on to perseverance. Perseverance is a challenging word. And I wanna remind us of something today is that in life, we're gonna have difficulties. Newsflash, okay? We're gonna have difficulties. It's not gonna be easy. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is not all on the mountaintop, is it? How many of you have experienced that before? It's not all on the mountaintop. That, let's be honest, that is unrealistic. When I was out in the Rocky Mountains a few weeks ago, and those of you who have been to the mountains, you realize to get from a 14,000 foot peak to another 14,000 foot peak, what's in the middle? The valley, the low spots. And in order to get there, you have to climb up and down and all over the place. Uh, You're walking through the mud, there's no sun, you're in danger of wild animals. We got stuck in a rain and hailstorm in, in a valley when we were out there. And, and you're just, you're prone. It's not fun, but here's the deal. That's more realistic, isn't it? That's more realistic of life. You're, the, dis, the disappointments that life can bring, the painful trials, when your plans are shattered, nobody enjoys them. I'm just gonna say that right now. Nobody likes that. In our minds, we think, well, everybody else seems to be doing fine during their tragedy, but I'm here melting away. No, no, they don't like it just as much as you don't. But here's what you can enjoy, is the the hope that God is working something out in the midst of you, on behalf of you. That's what you can persevere with. This word persevere does not mean just accept it and endure it. It has this forward look to it. It has a a forward lean to it. The writer of Hebrews, when he was talking about Jesus, he said this, who for the joy set before him did what? He endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus had a joy that was before him that enabled him to go through what he went through. You and I, we need to persevere through the trials that we're going through. Some of you, it's right now in this moment, today, you're going through a difficult trial. Let me encourage you and challenge you, persevere. Lean forward and look forward to what God is doing or going to do. He has not abandoned you. He will not and he cannot because he's a faithful God. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the hope of eternal life. He moves on to godliness, Peter says. This simply means this, God-likeness. You worship God and and you do it well. You wanna honor God, all right? Not just Sundays, but throughout your your days. You honor God, you worship him, you wanna be Christ-like, God-like. But you also seek the good of other people, the welfare of other people. Guys, this is practical Christianity right here, godliness. We have a double duty to God and to our neighbor. Paul even wrote in 1 Timothy that godliness has value for everything. Here's why. Here's why godliness is important. Practical Christianity, living it out. Here's why. Your testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important. We need to be godly. It's not the pious, you know, I'm better than everybody else because I have more of Jesus within me. That's not it at all. That's a horrible attitude but we're serving each other, we're serving our neighbor. That's part of godliness. He moves on to brotherly kindness. This is, brotherly kindness is what identifies to the world that we are a disciple of Jesus. If we love Jesus, we need to love each other and that starts with the people in this room, the people in in our church family, other Christians, sincerely, let me just add that, not pretending, this this is a continuation. You can be all nice and rosy and pray with someone today here at church and then be annoyed and not like them tomorrow. This is a sincere continuation of brotherly kindness to each other. So I challenge you, New Hope, continue to serve each other, all right? Continue to love each other. Man, I I feel so strongly that this is what we need to live out in our society right now. We, we need to be live differently according to God's word because people are looking for something 
that's wholesome. They're looking for something that is truly loving and kind. And if all they see is us nitpicking and fighting and getting angry with each other, they don't want to do that either. That's what the world is doing. Why would they want to be a part of that? You know what I mean? Don't act ugly with each other. Don't allow that anger to divide a relationship that you have with someone here at New Hope or in the the family of believers. Don't let that happen. That is the exact opposite of what Peter is trying to say. That's the exact opposite of kindness, brotherly kindness and godliness. He moves on to love. Love doesn't just stop with your family and other Christians. That's not enough. Uh, This needs to be extended to everyone. And I'll be the first to admit on this one, this is a matter of the will, more than emotions. This is more than sentimental feelings that I love this person and I'm showing agape love to this person. This is, man, I'm choosing to right now. I'm not gonna ask you to say it out loud, but who is that person that just grates you the wrong way? Right? Who is, who is it that that anger rises to the surface quickest for you when you think of them, when you talk to them? Who is that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus addresses this thought. He says, You have heard it that it was said, Love your enemy and, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will that get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? So who is that person? When was the last time you prayed for them? When was the last time you extended kindness to them and love to them? I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to be honest. This is not natural, right? It doesn't just automatically, like, anybody can just love their enemy. Listen, when there's someone who hates you, it's really tough to show them love, right? Am I the only one? Raise your hand, right? It's tough. This is not an easy thing. To the person who is rude and disrespectful to you, to the point where you just want to slap them across the face, right? And the love of Jesus, right? You, come on, I know that's in there within you. We have that within us. This, that showing love to someone like that is not natural, but it is supernatural. And here's why, because you have the divine power of God within you to do it, and you can. In your own strength, nope. But with the power of God, you can. Remember, you have everything you need to do this. I do wanna make sure something today, that you hear this. Because this list is given to us, if we work through it and we're working on it, that doesn't mean that God loves us more, all right? That's not a qualification for salvation. Jesus loved us before we ever loved, had a choice to do right or wrong, and Jesus paid that price for us, okay? But you and I, we have a responsibility. The Bible says that we need to stay connected to the vine. We have a responsibility to grow, because if we don't, here's what happens. We're gonna get to that. Here's what happens if you don't grow. You will become unproductive, you will become unfruitful or fruitless. So look at the consequences of not growing. That's your final point, the consequences of not growing. You're either growing spiritually or you're dying spiritually. There's strength in one and there's danger in the other. Here's what failure to grow leads to. Ineffective, unproductive, nearsighted, blind, forgetful. Is that what you want your life to be? I don't want my life to be like that. That's why I should never stop growing. When you become ineffective and unproductive, you become idle, you become unfruitful. You, you have a bunch of knowledge, but you're not living it out. You're not doing what you've, you've read. Listen, I know some very effective people and, and productive people for the kingdom of God. They don't have flashy personalities. They're like the behind the scenes type 
people. But listen, they are fruitful because they're faithful. They are effective because they're growing. And so Peter says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, meaning you are cultivating, you are working, you're growing these all the time, they are being used by God because of that. You can be nearsighted and blind or forgetful. How many of you saw the, the funny picture of the swimmer in the Olympics when they won and they pulled off their glasses? They didn't have context, so they couldn't see, so they're like squinting, like I don't know what the time is. Anybody see that before? It's funny. Okay, it's just me. All right. (laughs) But that person is nearsighted. They couldn't see very far. Listen, we can, if we're not growing, maybe it's because we're not looking for what is going to happen towards eternity. We're so focused here on this earth that we don't realize that there's an eternity that lies ahead of us, that Jesus is returning someday. We become blind to it. The Bible says, Peter says, you've been forgetful, you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins. Remember that Jesus crossed enemy lines to rescue you. Jesus went down into the deepest pit of your life and rescued you. Do not forget that. The precious blood of Jesus was shed for you. Do not forget that. The consequences of not growing are staggering. And like I said, in our culture, in our society, we need Christ-like followers that are growing in their faith. Amen? Amen. Worship team, would you join me? Before you can grow, everybody, listen. Before you can grow, it starts with the most basic step of placing your faith in Jesus. That's where it starts. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And if you're in a, in a spot today where you say, I want to place my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, but also my Lord, meaning I'm going to be a bondservant. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to follow him. If that's you, I want to pray in just a moment. Remember this. We want to help you. That's part of the the family of God is to help each other grow in our faith. So would you come see me, see one of the pastors before you leave so we can uh, talk with you, we can pray with you about this faith journey. So from your heart, as I pray, if that's you, would you join me as we pray? And let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love to us. Thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, for us to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, I pray for every person that is joining me in prayer, that they're placing their faith in you today, that you would set them free, God, that you would give them uh, a joy that is unspeakable because of the salvation that is in you, Jesus Christ. As they place their faith in you, as they place their trust in you as Lord and Savior. God, give them the strength. We thank you that you have given them everything they need to live an abundant life, a godly life. So today, see their hearts as they cry out to you. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, everybody here? Stand with me as we pray. So are you growing or have you stopped? Are you connected to that vine, like the Bible says, or are you disconnected? Is there fruit in your life? Is it growing, is it cultivating, or is it becoming like that mushy, bruised up tomato that nobody likes to eat? What is your life? And only you can answer this, okay? So this is is a very practical thing. Part of the, the, the response today happens when we leave this place. But we're going to pray in just a moment, and we're going to pray that that we would respond to God and what he's saying to us. So that's the bigger question is, what is God saying to you throughout this entire morning? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? What area of your life do you need to cultivate and grow? Because if we're honest with ourselves, there's probably at least one thing. If you're like me, there's multiple things. We need to cultivate, we need to grow. Here's the deal, and here's why. We need to live differently than the culture. Peter, he didn't want the readers of this letter to blend in with society. 
you needed to stand out, basically, is what he's wanting them to do. We need to do the same, don't we? Our culture is divided, it's, it's dark, it's sinful. We need to be Christ-like followers that shine so bright for Jesus Christ that we point people to him. So when somebody sees your life, do they see Jesus or do, do they see the world? Do they see someone with self-control or someone who needs to get a grip of themselves, right? What is it? So as we pray and we'll sing, I'm asking you to respond in your heart to what God is saying to you. You're welcome to come to the altar if you want to pray. I encourage you to find a place to pray and respond to God because that's truly where the cultivating begins, all right? So God, as we respond to you today and what it is that you are saying to us, would you challenge us, forgive us for not growing, show us areas of our life that we need to grow in, and we do this all with your strength and your power, in Jesus' name, would you respond today? Jesus, we respond to you today, that we build our life upon you, upon your word, and the love that you've given us, show us, lead us, and guide us in every area of our hearts and every area of our life that needs to grow. We thank you that you're faithful, that we're not, you know we're not perfect, and that we have lots of places that we can grow in. And so I pray that we don't leave defeated and discouraged today, but, but you would uh, speak life into every person here that this is possible because you have given us everything that we need. We don't have to do this alone, that you, your strength and your power is within us to help us, to guide us. So let's make every effort, church, to grow in our faith. Let's apply all that diligence that we have within us to grow. Every one of us has a responsibility. Myself, the pastors, the teachers, everybody. We all have that responsibility. And here's why it's important. Our culture needs Christ-like people. That's what is needed in our culture. I don't want to sit around and wait for other people to do it. I have a responsibility as well to grow. Amen? Amen. I pray that God blesses you and leads you and guides you this week. God, would you protect as we go from this place and as we begin what you have spoken to us today, as we leave this place, that you would equip us. In your wonderful name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Church, have a great week. Have fun growing in your faith.